Hi, my name is Paul Handy, Global Head of Cyber at Crawford. Welcome to the second session in this series on cyber risk. Today, focusing on cyber BI, specifically understanding risk and exposure from a claims perspective. Firstly, let me introduce you to my three colleagues. We have Edward Layton. Edward is a director of our Forensic Accounting Division in London. He's worked with me extensively on a number of cyber BI claims over the last six to seven years, and I'm extremely grateful to have him with us. We also have Peter Courthards. Peter Courthards is head of our Forensic Accounting Division in the Netherlands and has responsibility for continental Europe. Peter has worked on some of the largest cyber BI losses that we've dealt with out of the Benelux region and a lot of manufacturing losses coming out of Germany, for example. And finally, but by no means least, we have Janice Hagenberger. Janice is a managing director of our CFAS division in the United States and has responsibility for North America, works extensively for the North American market, as well as uh, on international losses coming out of the rest of the world. I should state from the outset that in many markets within which we operate, the role of the forensic accountant is to determine quantum without reference to the policy or determination of coverage. Through our extensive experience in responding to and managing claims, we do, however, gain a level of understanding of the various coverages that exist, the application thereof, and related issues that might ensue. Applying this experience to the still, still developing cyber BI market will, I hope, lead to some interesting discussion and debate today. So firstly, moving on to our first topic, which is around the maximum indemnity period. One of the key issues or features of a cyber BI policy is that they often have a relatively short maximum indemnity period, three to six months, which is aligned to the period of restoration or limited thereon. So Edward, what, what is the impact of this from a quantum recovery and or exposure perspective? Or perhaps if you can, referencing a couple of examples from your experience. Sure, I think um, the problem um, from the point of view of the insured is, is obviously that very often we're finding that uh, an insured has a loss of revenue which ultimately falls outside the indemnity period. And that's especially true in cases where there is a fairly long lead time between a, an insured receiving an order and actually translating that order into sales. Um, so, for example, I had a case recently whereby the length of time between actually the uh, order being uh, lodged with the insured and a sale being realized is approximately eight months uh, and that particular cyber policy had a 90-day maximum indemnity period so as you can see all of the potential lost revenue is going to fall outside the maximum indemnity period um, it sometimes works the other way, I think, with um, cases whereby there is significant sales makeup or potential for sales makeup. Um, in that sort of case, the insurer is very much disadvantaged. And I think the, the general rule is that if you have an insured who is making a very uh, specific bespoke product or offering a bespoke service, which can't easily be substituted or replicated, then you really do need to have a fairly long maximum indemnity period so that the insurer can benefit from sales makeup uh, when, when that kicks in. Um, we had, for example, um, a case a little while ago where we were looking at um, a cyber attack on um, an auction house, uh, on um, an online auction house, um, and there was a 90 day maximum indemnity period on that. Um, the attack actually occurred while there was a sale in progress and the sale had to be immediately cancelled. And initially we thought that the sale could be rearranged within the 90 day indemnity period. But for various reasons um, that couldn't be done. And the insured informed us that they were actually going to rearrange the sale some nine months later. Um, now, technically, the insured could have claimed for the loss of revenue within the maximum indemnity period because they lost their commission, their revenue from that particular sale, which had to be cancelled. Um, and they would also make that up um, sometime later, nine months later, without any benefit to insurers of that makeup. Uh, interestingly, what in fact happened in that particular case was the, the insured uh, very fairly uh, withdrew the claim for any loss of revenue and there was an agreement with insurers purely to pay some increased marketing costs. 
Um, but I think that there is a, a case here that, you know, you have to look and see exactly what type of business the insured is in, what they're doing, what sort of product they're, they're selling and tailoring very much the maximum indemnity period so that it's equitable to both insurer and insured. Okay, thank you. Um, Peter, would you like to add anything to that, um, perhaps with reference to sums insured or limits? Uh, yes, thank you, Paul. Um, what we see in, in continental Europe is that indemnity periods on cyber products are generally a bit longer than um, I hear from the uh, UK market. We are looking at indemnity periods varying from uh, 13 weeks to 12 months. Um, though what we also see is that um, a lot of uh, insurers sell more or less standard, sell more or less standard products where uh, they have an indemnity period of say 12 months, but there's some insured of only say 10 million. So they sell those products to 50 million uh, euro sales uh, companies, but also to 500 million sales companies. And the 10 million then needs to be split up between incident response costs and business interruption. So for instance, is 50% of that sum is destined for business interruption. So 50% of 10 million is 5 million. And you have a 500 million sales company that's effectively 1% of your sales is two days. So then the 12 months becomes a little bit moot. Understood. Understood. And I suppose the risk with all of this is that these policies are not fit for purpose and, and the, the insurer doesn't see the value in taking out this policy. And we've talked about, Edward, you referenced the need for tailored wordings, um, but also, as we've said, there's still a lot of reliance on off the shelf product. But what solutions are there? Um, Edward, um, how can we uh, perhaps address the issue of delayed revenue losses? Um, I think one possible solution could be that the uh, maximum ind indemnity period doesn't actually kick in on the date of loss, which is which is the norm at the moment, certainly in the UK. So we could have a situation whereby let's suppose that an insured has a 90 day maximum indemnity period, but rather that kicking in on the day when the attack is actually discovered, the insured could, let's say, elect to defer that by however long they wanted to. Now, it may be that it would be best to have um, that deferment by mutual agreement. So both insurer and insured would agree at what point the maximum indemnity period would start to kick in. So ideally, if there was a if there was a lead time between the order and actually a sale crystallizing of let's say four or five months, the insured may elect to have the indemnity period start five months or six months after the cyber attack has been uh, has been discovered. Okay. Um, Janice, um, in the in the US, uh, traditional BI wordings frequently incorporate an extended period of indemnity. Um, for the for the audience, could I uh, ask you first to explain what this is? and then maybe comment on the potential application for Cyber BI. Sure. Yeah. Um, so in the US, as you said, you know, there, we often see this extended period of indemnity endorsement or option. Um, it's typically, you know, we refer to it as an EPOI. Um, so you'll hear that often when people are speaking. Um, and it adds coverage to the traditional business interruption policy for, um, you know, loss of income that's suffered during a specific period of time after the damaged property is repaired. Um, many times, you know, we see the extended periods to be 30 days, 60 days, or maybe 90 days. However, that can vary. And I have seen an extended period of indemnity go as long as 12 months subsequent the initial indemnity on the policy. Um, in the absence, you know, of this type of an endorsement, then the business interruption coverage typically would end, right, when the damaged property is repaired or replaced. So the extended period of indemnity can play a very important role on the policies. Um, and since, you know, cyber is, is relatively new to all of us, I think, you know, we can learn a lot from our property experience, you know, to lend us some guidance in the cyber world. Um, you know, adding, you know, a, a clause similar to this to a cyber policy, I think will, you know, allow the forensic accountant the opportunity to look beyond that 
original period of indemnity or outage period, you know, whether it's, you know, outage interruption or degradation period. Um, this can be, I think this could be very beneficial to um, a cyber policy. Um, and it can be beneficial from both the insurer's perspective, right? Because it would allow the accountant to analyze some financial data regarding potential makeup or that delayed in revenue recognition that we had just mentioned. Um, but also from the insured's perspective, again, kind of going on top of what Edward was just saying, you know, it allow it allows the accountant to analyze that financial data um, as they may not be back to pre-loss conditions or functionality or service that existed prior to the loss. Um, so it gives us the opportunity to look subsequent to that period. Um, and it's and that becomes very important in in the manufacturing businesses that we see or when there's work in process and you have a pipeline that you have to consider. Um, and another area would be is if, if an insured is using stock or inventory to continue their operations. Again, um, if they draw that down, then you know it's going to take us into a, a period after their their repairs or replacement is done, um, and that extended period of indemnity can play an important role. Again, um, I think you know with again with cyber claims as you know as as Edward and Peter had already mentioned. Um, you know, it's the rev it's the recognition of revenue and, and whatever the practices are for that specific, you know, business. Um, and if there's that lag in revenue uh, on the financial statements, then having that EPOI clause would be beneficial for us to be able to look outside that period. Definitely. I mean, I think it has direct application, Janice, and, and, and something that hopefully we'll be seeing more and more of as these cyber BI policies become more sophisticated um, and arguably, as we said, uh, you know, more fit for purpose um, as, as the product is built out further. Yes. Um, this, this moves us on to our, our second topic, which is around direct losses. Um, and we've seen cyber BI policies evolve over the past five years, particularly by reference to reputational loss. And initially this was specifically excluded that it was sometimes brought back in as a defined head of cover. But more lastly, we're seeing the majority of policies focus on direct losses without specific reference to reputational loss or harm, but to potentially bringing in such losses for consideration if they can be directly attributed to the insured incident or incurred within the maximum indemnity period and or the period of restoration. Peter, um, can you talk about what you're seeing in Europe, uh, specifically difficulties that attach to establishing quantum and noting the general nature of a, of a cyber event. Um, yes, um, in continental Europe, we do not see the practice that um, reputational losses are excluded. They are often not even mentioned in the policy where the policy uh, mentioned business interruption losses in a general way following a cyber incident. So they are implicitly included. Um, and additionally, I think it's it's very, from a measurement point of view, it's very difficult to um, discern losses from a reputational uh, background against losses from from either directly from a cyber background. I mean, both run into each other and inter interfere in the same in the same time period. Um, a cyber loss is by definition a system loss. Your systems are out and it's not linked to a specific location or a specific type of machinery. So it's a general outage which may affect all of your systems or may just affect part of your system. So it's the job of the forensic accountant to understand the relationship between the systems and the revenue generating capacity of the of the insured or the or the um, affected location. And often that's not not very um, very easy, because systems uh, can run across companies, can run across locations, and can run across processes. And we had uh, one example of um, a relatively simple uh, ransomware attack, but um, um, which more or less hit the order entry system, the uh, stock uh, picking order picking system, the uh, or uh, raw material purchases system and the production planning system. So if all of those systems are integrated, 
um, a company who effectively makes uh, plastic components is unable to operate at all. And Edward, um, is there a risk of exaggeration or misdirection of unrelated performance losses? Um, I think, Paul, that that's always present. Um, and I think that that actually really extends not just to cyber, but just to, to general property damage losses when you're looking at business interruption. But I think from a, a cyber perspective, um, I think that's especially true. And I think particularly so at the moment because of, uh, of COVID. Um, and there's obviously um, a temptation uh, on the part of uh, an insured to uh, who, who usually will not be insured for COVID related losses. There's obviously a temptation to try and, and push as much as possible, uh, perhaps to, to blame as much as possible on the cyber attack, uh, which is covered. Um, and we're seeing this more and more. I think what, what tends to, seems to have happened, certainly if we've had cyber losses where the date of loss is around April, March uh, of, of 2020, just when COVID was starting, was starting to hit. Um, we're seeing that a, a number of insureds actually um, prepared uh, what, what they call a, a post-COVID budget and are trying to use that as a basis for, um, for measuring any loss related to a cyber attack. I think the problem with that is what we're finding is that certainly um, when those post-COVID budgets were drawn up, which was usually sort of February, March 2020, just around the time of the first lockdown, there's a huge underestimation of how bad COVID was going to hit. So they can't really be used as, as a basis for measurement. And we're having to find other means to, to measure the impact of cyber and be very careful about separating that from the impact of COVID. Um, certainly in a number of businesses where we've had cyber attacks, the effect of COVID has been far greater than the cyber attack. Uh, and we've got to uh, make sure that that comes out in the figures at the end of the day. Okay, excellent. Our final topic uh, is around ransom demands. Um, and there's continuing debate and changing attitudes towards the payment of ransoms or extortion demands. A part of this is legally driven in the form of sanctions or potential penalties that exist for breach. But there's also a moral angle uh, in as much as whether by providing coverage for this type of risk, we as an industry are supporting or enticing criminal behaviour. Whatever the outcome, uh, we're seeing a huge uptick in the size and scale of ransom demands, combined with far greater due diligence around the consideration for the payment of ransoms, which can lead to uh, insurers supporting it or, or it can lead to delay in respect of that decision making process. Um, to Edward again, what, what is the potential impact from a BI perspective? If cover for ransom payment or extortion demand is ultimately excluded from uh, cyber policies? Um, I think this creates a number of uh, interesting scenarios. I think first of all it, it's, it's a brave uh, move by insurers to, uh, to do this as a, as a way of generally uh, combating the whole um, cyber attack problem. Um, and I think more insurers will, will be looking at, uh, at ways of, of taking this into account as well. I think one of the problems though is that um, if you have a situation where the ransom is not covered by the insurance policy, the insured uh, may ultimately be quite reluctant to pay that ransom payment out of their own pocket, especially if the losses which that ransom payment will mitigate are all going to fall within the maximum indemnity period and are therefore covered anyway. So you may get a situation where by the uh, interests of insurers and the insured are no longer uh, well aligned um, and that could lead to some some interesting scenarios. I, I, it's going to be interesting to see if insurers uh, could insist on an insured paying a ransom payment on the basis that they have a duty to mitigate um, and we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. I think one of the scenarios that that is likely to happen uh, and we've seen this in other contexts before is that even though the ransom payment may not be covered it's likely that it, the insured and insurers may reach a compromise solution whereby they both actually contribute towards a ransom payment because it's it may be in the interests of insurers to to mitigate their own exposure and it also may be well within the interests of 
the insured to mitigate any uncovered losses, so any losses that fall outside of the indemnity period and therefore won't be picked up by the policy. I think it's going to be it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and what ultimately insurers look to do here. I, I think I find it hard to think to see that uh, ransom payments will ultimately be excluded or not covered. Um, but I think we're going to see further restrictions potentially around that. Maybe limits will apply. Um, Janice, um, just by way of a final comment um, from you really on the role of the forensic accountant, not only in quantifying loss, but also aligned to this, providing that increasingly important advice around the mitigation uh, of, of, of incidents to include that, that economic test. Yes, um, the insured always has the duty to mitigate their loss. Um, and I think there are lots of considerations that need to be taken into account regarding um, claims in general, but also cyber claims. The, you know, the ransom demands need to be weighed, you know, out between the demand amount and the quantification of the loss itself. Um, additionally, the time period needs to be considered, you know, whether the uh, amount falls within the indemnity period or if there's going to be an extended indemnity period. But I think the role of the forensic accountant um, becomes very crucial in cyber claims. It's you know, very important to not only understand that the understanding of the business itself, but how the policy is in force at the time and you know, how we go about quantifying those potential losses. Um, I think the forensic accountant can, can lead, lend you know, the, their expertise um, as to the understanding of the financial records, um, and again, important, you know, understanding the recognition of revenue and how that um, impacts the records that we're looking at. Um, but where it's, it's critical to have the forensic accountant in there early on um, to work with the adjusters and, uh, you know, the considerations within the policy. Absolutely. And I think it's absolutely vital. It's something we're seeing more and more of. And and bringing in the, the parallel role of the adjuster and the accountant is, is very much paramount to that. Peter, uh, final point from you, uh, comment from you. Any, any comments from a, from a, a European perspective? Um, well, yes, what was uh, the final comment on ransom, ransomware? Uh, what we're seeing is that the ransomware perpetrators become more sophisticated in that they, um, before they block the systems, they do thorough investigation of the insured systems to make sure that they block a systems that are essential to the revenue generating capacity of the insured. And also what we're seeing is that the uh, ransomware amounts which are demanded are generally moving between 0.5 and 2% of the, of the revenues of the insured. So it seems that the perpetrators uh, know what they're doing and they also seem to be able to find a speed, sweet spot to determine or to make the decision easier uh, to consider ransomware um, an opportunity to limit uh, business interruption losses. Okay, thank you. And, and thank you, panel. Um, extremely interesting debate. We could have continued talking for another half an hour uh, quite easily. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us today. Um, I hope you found it interesting. Um, if you, if you like what you saw and you'd like to learn more about what we do, please visit www.crawfordgts.com. Um, and thank you, and we hope to see you again soon.